say thank you for everyone for coming here tonight. Uh, I'm Detective Council Elvis Lee. Uh, before I start, I just want to say thank you to Council Chan here. He's been working so hard in bringing this uh, presentation together so that you can do uh, Detective Bada and he's going to start the program tonight. Thank you very much, Ellis. First of all, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, this is a fraud presentation, but it could also be a presentation on preservation of wealth. And you'll see that, that it's so important because all our lives, we're always working hard, but we forget the steps to preserve our wealth. And you'll see that in this presentation. And this slide is, if you have to remember the presentation, this is probably the most important slide that, you, that I would say you, you need to know. And for this part, I'm gonna get everybody to stand up and recite this anti-fraud pledge with us, with us together. And you'll see why I'm doing this. So together with me, I promise to treat email or text message requesting my personal information or money with this belief. I promise not to panic, to ask the caller and tell the number so we're not alone in fighting fraud. The police work with also a lot of government agencies and private agencies to protect the community and the public. Let's, let's find out the level of our, what we know about fraud. So the first question is, if there's only a small enough amount of money involved when somebody asks you, it's probably not a scam. Is that true or false? False. Good. Credit-based scams only occur when someone contacts you. If you get an email from the CRA asking you to confirm or prove your personal financial information, it's always safe to do so. Oh. It's like going to school again. <laughs> and that's what it is. It's safe to enter your personal financial information into a pop-up window or a website. Oh. True or false? Let's cut off here. The usual suspects who might want to scam you may include strangers, friend, uh, friends, or relatives. Everybody. You say relatives? Everybody. All of the above. Exactly. All of the above. Watch the relatives. <laughs> it's the number one crime against senior citizens. And why would you say it's the number one? Why would I say it's the number one crime? Gullible. Gullibility? Vulnerable. Vulnerable? Trustworthy. Trusting? Trustworthy. Lonely? Lonely? So, in the 1930s, the, the FBI arrested this famous bank robber called John Dillinger. And they asked him, John, how can you rob banks? And he said, well, that's what the money is. <laughs> These are some of the scams, uh, occurrences happening in your region right now. Sometimes you don't even have to leave your house. In this particular case, you could be in your house, answer an email, answer a text message, or even answer your door, and you get scammed by people. So it's, it's not that you need to get out there to be scammed or, or to be a victim of fraud. the legal definition under the criminal code for but for our purposes it's somebody who's being deceitful somebody who's lying to you somebody's using some sort of trickery and not being truthful and taking <laughs> your valuables or your money I just want to ask something here when a crime happened to you how are you upset you're not happy about it right 
really very angry about it. Someone did something wrong to you, okay? But when fraud happens, sometimes you'll be smiling. You think someone's doing you a favor. <coughs> For example, on the invest uh, investment fraud, uh, someone would be saying that you're taking a lot of money and you trust them, you give the money to them, and you're smiling at that time. But then you got to go. Thank you. So these are some of the things that we can do. You know, <coughs> fraud is something different from any other criminal offense. We're all here today right now, and if somebody breaks into our homes or our cars, you know, we have no control of that <coughs> because we're all here and nobody's home or nobody's looking after our car. But with fraud, it's a totally different type of criminal offense. You actually <coughs> have control of this offense, whether it's going to happen or not. And you relinquish that authority. You actually, in order to, for the fraud to occur, have to participate in the criminal offense. So either by giving your identity, either by handing over your money, your valuables or your, your personal bank account information for the offense to take place. So if you eliminate any one of these things, the likelihood of a criminal offense fraud occurring, you know, you're protecting yourself. So we answered that, right? It used to be organized criminals and terrorists, but now the opportunities. Anybody who has a, has a vested interest or has an opportunity to deprive you, a lot of times, it's you know family members. Right? You said vulnerability <clears throat> when you become vulnerable. For the police service, it's very difficult because only about five percent of, of in this particular case, mass marketing fraud. Only five percent of the victims report the fraud to us. So when you see statistics <coughs> like these. You have to understand that, that 90 or 95 percent of the uh, statistics are not reported to the police. You notice between the ages of, say, 40 and 70, it spikes up, right? And we talked about that, right? Because that's where you have all your wealth. They're not targeting somebody who's 9, 10 or 19 or 20. Not as much because they have right? money. Right? The seniors and the middle class have the money. So if you live in Ontario and you're between the ages of say 50, 49, and 80, very likelihood of, of you becoming a victim of fraud. It's so important to look after your identity and your uh, driver's license, whether it's your social insurance card. We notice that a lot of the fraud investigations that we do in our service, it starts off with your identity is being compromised. Somebody grabs your driver's license, somebody grabs your passport, and with that valuable information, they can open up bank accounts, they can practically do anything they want with that uh, ID cards. So that's a quick tip for you. Uh, if you carry your wallet, and inside of your wallet, you have your social insurance number and your driver license. If you lose that, I can create a profile on you, on your name. So therefore, don't carry those two pieces of ID together. You need your driver license to drive, no problem. But don't carry your social insurance number. Because once I get both two pieces of identification, then your credit is open to me. The three Gs? Yes. You guys talk about it. You guys are very good about it. Why do we get defrauded? Well, with all of them, we believe what other people are saying a lot of times, okay? We don't question that. So what I need you to do after tonight is question everything. And suspect all the people, why they ask me the question, why they want your personal information, why they want to transfer money and so on. Goodness, we are good people. We want to believe, we want to trust some people. We don't think that people are out to rob us. But unfortunately, that's what they're targeting us on, on our goodness. Greed. Uh, the three Gs. Uh, greed. Um, we want to make money. We want to make a fast buck, but there's no such thing. If something is too good to be true, 
that is typically to be true. You'll see that in your handout that we have for you. sensitive information out there which can come back and harm us. Remember earlier we mentioned, we said that we sometimes relinquish power and we become a victim of fraud? This is another way. Once you post something on the social media, it's public domain. It's not your domain anymore. Anyone can get it. Exactly. And sometimes it's good for us because, you know, some dumb criminals post uh, <laughs> their actions, right? In this particular case, he's stealing gas from a cruiser, from a police cruiser, and he posts his picture on there, so it works for us. Uh, this was an investigation a few years ago in Markham that we investigated, the major fraud unit investigated, and I'll, I'll just let the tape run and we'll go through there. Search warrants resulting in uh, 
the seizure of uh, two motor vehicles, uh, uh, approximately fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars in cash, thirty-eight caliber uh, revolver, and ammunition. You see how lucrative it is for the uh, fraudsters. So they continue doing that. In this particular case, a lot of the the mail was compromised. So a lot of the theft of mail with uh, with your IDs were used to manufacture in a lab in Markham. And from there, they were able to get other IDs and open up bank accounts, open up uh, you know documents under under the uh, unsuspecting uh, victims because they were still waiting for their information in the mail. So you only need the two social insurance number. They get the full name from your mail. They get the address from your mail. And they get a date of birth from one piece of your mail. And there we go. They open the account. Fishing. Do you know what, what fishing is? I fish it every single day. <laughs> <laughs> it's casting a big net, whether it's by email, whether it's by text messages. I'll give you an example. Just recently, my father's uh, getting out of the bank, and he's walking out, and he gets a text message. So he picks up the phone, uh, picks up his phone and looks at the text message and it says, your RBC account has been compromised. And it's not the first time that he's received this text message. He receives them on a daily basis. But in this particular case, he had just walked out of the branch. He said, oh my God, something's happened to my bank account. And he started walking back to the branch. And he said, oh, you know what? Let me call my son and see what's that all about. He came to his senses. But in that emotional moment, he thought, oh, should I be answering this text message? Should I be going back to the branch? And he called me. So to become a victim of fraud has nothing to do with your intelligence level. It's that emotional moment that you have. And in this particular case, this fishing target by the froster almost got my father. I just want to add something there. I'm uh, sorry. It doesn't matter how old you are, your age, your sex, or your education, or your occupation. We use internet banking here, I do, okay? You go, you log on, your banking information is on. All of a sudden, on your computer, a window pop up, and it's saying that uh, we need to verify your, there's a security issue, we need to verify your password again. Type your password in there again. What happened, that's the Trojan. That's the spyware. It popped up because you've been on some other site. And then it's asking you, oh, I'm sorry. It's asking you information about your password. Once you give the password to the bad guys in that little screen, they have your banking information and your password. Now let's just talk about the spyware and the ransomware that comes gets onto you. A lot of promises on the net, you know, whether it's the, you know, targeting the housewives who are at home and say in a quick way to make money and things like that, right? If it's too good to be true, right? It's probably a scam. These are some of the best practices, right? When was the last time you changed your password to your account? A lot of times we go to coffee shops and we're using the uh, free Wi-Fi, right? And you'll see in the presentation, right? A lot of people use their Wi-Fi at the airports and that becomes a problem. We've got free Wi-Fi here too. Free Wi-Fi here? Yeah. <laughs>
so your favorite singer is coming to town, or maybe it's your favorite sports team, you want to go, but the event is sold out. For some Canadians, that is not the end of the story. They go looking for other options to get those tickets, but they may end up getting disappointed instead. Ian Hanamansing has more on their ticket troubles. Even outside the arena, it was a party as Katy Perry fans arrived for this concert in Vancouver. So just imagine how crushing it must have been to get this close <laughs> and discover the ticket you bought online was counterfeit. This is so embarrassing. Well, I learned all of this the hard way when I bought four of these tickets for $600. They looked real enough. The guy who sold it to me seemed believable. But then I learned two things how easy it is to get cheated, and how police don't really have the time or resources to investigate many of these frauds. But every once in a while, there's an exception. I found out that uh, from 2013 to 2014, we have over like uh, close to 2,000 ads. 2,000 ads. Yes. An investigation by police in Aurora, north of Toronto, started with a pair of fake Miley Cyrus tickets. Strangely, the seller used the same phone number for all of these deals. Mm -hmm advertising online. He faces 36 criminal charges, including two counts of fraud over $5,000. Detective Elvis Lee says among the victims, a couple who bought tickets for themselves and friends. I have one particular victim, uh, this couple, they uh, lost close to $10,000. Unfortunately for them, they actually have to take a loan from the RSP to repay all the friends, and they have lost so many friends over this embarrassment. Experts say you should do your homework before making a ticket purchase among their suggestions. Research the cost of the tickets. If a deal sounds too good to be true, well, it probably is. Don't be rushed into making a purchase quickly. Stick with well-known sites like Ticket. This was an investigation I did about uh, two years ago. Uh, for me, if there's a crime happened and there's uh, bad guys out there, I want to get the money back to you. I care about you guys. That's what I do. Uh, sometimes I might go up to court and stuff like that, but really the best way is to get the money back to you. On this case, I recover about $40,000. I wish I could do more. I spent most of the money already. So. Yeah, in, in this case, we were lucky that Elvis was able to get a partial you know, money for everybody, but that's not the case in a lot of times because you see the fraudsters, they spend most of their money to support their lavish lifestyle. And the smart fosters put the money out, went overseas in, in uh, bank accounts, which we can't, you know, find, or, you know, it's hard for us to retrieve that money. CRA scams. It used to happen only around tax season, but again, it's become so lucrative for the fraudsters that they target everyone, Canadians and Americans, every day of the year, constantly, whether it's by telephone, whether it's by email, and text messages. So a typical method is they'll call you on the phone and say, it's the CRA, you know, you owe us some taxes from the past, we have warrants out for your arrest, they have sirens playing, they know all the, the tools and all the way to get you. Do you see what's happening? They're trying to break you down, put you in an abominable emotional state. Because we all know CRA doesn't call us. Right? They don't call. Right? They may send you a letter, right? And you can look at the letter and you can say, okay, call this number. But the fact is they call, they spoof your number or the CRA number, and you think, oh. 613, oh, 705, North Bay, Ottawa, yeah, that's gotta be CRA. Again, it's just a step for you to get into an emotional state where you become vulnerable and you become a target. I just want to tell you that your commission of police do not engage in collecting taxes. Uh, <laughs> Canada will do that all day. <laughs> uh, can we just go back once? This one is a 2015 figure, $5.7 million. This is about close to 10 times more right now than 2017. And the victims at 1,900, and we're looking at close to 10 times too. And remember, those numbers, only about 5 to 10% of what's reported. So there's a lot more out there. <coughs>
money transfer scam. Uh, a lot of times, uh, the fraudster would be on the phone asking you to transfer money. Well, you you're wondering, well, how, how are they going to get you to transfer money? Well, they can say that uh, you want a price, you want a lottery, fifty million dollars, ten million dollars. But the catch is, uh, well, because you want the money, and uh, we need to uh, administer the money for you. You have to send us some money first for the administration. Then, if you fall for that, then they're going to ask you, uh, you're going to pay tax on those money. Give me some more money for your tax. And then, oh, you should get a lawyer. You should get a trust account. On and on and on. We're going to show you something later on about how detrimental this kind of uh, crime is. Yeah, on this one, uh, currently, there's a trend going that uh, you will get a call, and that uh, they will say that uh, are you so and so? They have your name already, and they will say that usually from China, uh, targeting Chinese population, and in Mandarin, they will speak in Mandarin. They said that this is the Chinese police. Uh, we have uh, apprehended a person, and they have information about you and your bank account. We believe that your money is a, is a activity, uh, uh, criminal activities from crime, uh, obtained from criminal activity, and, and it's a criminal money. So we want that money to send to China into the courthouse to prove that the money is legitimate. After you send the money, it's gone, okay? Just on this part, the fact that is it possible for just to speak briefly in Mandarin, because this is actually what's been in the news for the last few days. Uh, yeah, we're, 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 we're coming to that. The, yeah. Oh, okay. This one. We're okay. coming to this one? Yes. Okay. To Please hold the questions to an answer. Yeah. <laughs> Did you want us to elaborate on this? Because we get a lot of the government. Well, that's why I thought, particularly in the language, people feel very comfortable. Uh, you want to do that? Uh, Government 里边有假的护照然后我们通过这几天的时间把这个事情通过国际行政给你摆平了你的电话告诉他所以这个呢这几个都是这样的他就这么一套,对吧?所有的信息都是这么一套,好吗? So, right now, uh, I'm going to hand the time to uh, uh, Dr. Sajima Vega. And she is currently handling an investigation of this type, and she's going to talk to you about it. Okay, so the most current trend right now is called virtual kidnapping. 
Toronto, you might have seen it on the news in the past couple of days, Toronto had four virtual kidnappings on uh, last Friday, but we had one a few weeks ago. So uh, it targets Chinese nationals. Um, obviously York Region has a big Chinese population, so do different parts in Toronto. Um, this actually started last summer in BC. Again, uh, a large Chinese population out there. So what happens is they target kids who are going to school in Canada whose parents are still in China. So what happens is the kids in our, I'll, I'll give you our case because it, it took a week, it's this thick, it took a week and there were 117 investigative actions done on this case. So what happened was there's a 15 year old boy and he gets a phone call from the Chinese government and they say a bank account got opened in your name in China, the guy's a drug dealer, there's a bit of a problem and you don't need to report this to the Canadian police because they're not going to help you and they'll probably arrest you and, and, and send you back here. But, and your parents are here, we don't want anything to happen to them so we're going, you, you probably need to speak to the Chinese police. I can actually transfer you over to the Chinese police. The kid gets transferred over to the Chinese police and the guy says, okay, what you're gonna do because you know your parents are in a lot of danger, what you need to do, now keep in mind, this is a 15 year old boy from China. He's not American or Canadian, okay? He's over at high school in York region. So he is told you need to leave your house. He lives in the house with his 17 year old sister. He, so you need to leave the house for a few days and you need to get a new phone and a new phone number. You can use the WeChat app on your phone and we're gonna contact you and tell you different things to do, but you gotta get out of the house like right now and don't come back until we tell you. So this kid leaves. Uh, a short while later, his sister gets a phone call um, from China saying that your brother's been kidnapped and you better get a hold of your parents because what was the amount, Nick? Like, it was five, five, five million. million. Five million dollars, RMB. What is this, that? Uh, it's uh, one million dollars mm -hmm. Canadian. Okay, so a million, so I want a million bucks. So the daughter phones her dad and says, Dad, so-and-so has been kidnapped, my brother's been kidnapped, I won't tell you his name, and um, we gotta pay them a million dollars. The girl reports this to us right away. Now, we haven't heard virtual kidnapping up until a few weeks ago, thank you to the RCMP, but anyways, we didn't know. So we uh, initiate a report, Nick just happened to be the officer, and a report was in and then my detectives have to investigate it. Long story short, the parents come over from China and they thought it was a scam of some sort. We thought it was a scam straight away, but we thought the boy was involved in the scam, trying to scam his parents out of money. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the kidnappers call back and they say, okay, we want a million bucks. Then the parents are like, no, we can't afford that. A large sum of money was paid. It wasn't near a million dollars because the parents were concerned and out of the abundance of caution, they decided to uh, pay some ransom. Meanwhile, the boy had sent, was told by the Chinese police officers that kept calling him to go to a bathroom, take off your shirt, take a photo of you, of you and then take a video, <coughs> upload it on WeChat, saying, don't worry, I'm a dad, I'm okay. So he doesn't. <laughs> so we're thinking, okay, what is he doing? Um, so we have the bank's help uh, <coughs> they can get us banking information straight away. So the kid had an ATM card. So we traced the ATM card and um, there's money coming out of his account and um, lots of ATM machines have videos, like pictures. So oh, oh, two weeks ago, Mon two weeks ago Monday, this past month, yes, yesterday, uh, the stuff comes in over the weekend from the bank. There's a picture of Junior at the ATM. We look at his, his his bank card and where he's been using it and he's using it around all sorts of 24-hour internet places around Young and Finch. So go down to Young and Finch because we're going to find him down there because he was down there on Sunday. It's only Monday morning. He'll be down there. They find him in a Starbucks. Now, we haven't heard about virtual kidnapping yet, so we arrest him because we think he's involved in the scam. As it turns out, he's a victim of the scam so he's then unarrested. My point is this, what they do is they tell one kid 
you need to leave your house, you need to change your phone number, you have to stay away for a few days. And then they phone the other kid to say, get a hold of your parents because your brother or sister's been kidnapped. That's what happened four times on Friday in Toronto. Now, we hadn't got, <clears throat> Toronto knew that we had had uh, kidnappings like this, one kidnapping like this, so they phoned us to ask us, like, <clears throat> how did you guys solve this, these things? Because now, all of a sudden, we have four of them. Again, information, I guess, is slow from the RCMP in the West Coast coming over to the East Coast, and it seemingly takes several months. Um, they knew that we, we had one and that the, the missing person is a victim. They're not, they're not colluding in the, in the scam, they're victims of it. So thankfully these kids weren't arrested, ours was unfortunately, but then unarrested, he's fine. Um, so these are young uh, Chinese national kids at, in Canada with either other siblings or relatives. Mom and dad are in China. So what we're doing now in York Region to try to stop this, not only Toronto did a great job of putting it on the TV, so now it's become, a, a, the public's more aware, but what we're going to do now is go get our school officers to hit all the high schools. We're going to identify these Chinese national kids, because that's the only people it's happening to right now. Now, Elvis told me when we were talking earlier today that this scam started with Spanish people, right? Mexican. Oh, Mexican. So, so right now, in our community, in the GTA as a whole, it's happening to Chinese nationals. So we're going to identify these kids in all the schools in Richmond Hill and Markham, Thornhill, Vaughan, and um, make them aware. If you get a phone call saying you need to do X, Y, Z, and it's the um, Chinese government and the Chinese police, we're going to ask them not to pay attention to it and to notify a teacher, guidance counselor, and or the police, because, I mean, they'll call us, but if the kids don't feel comfortable calling the police, they're young, they don't know us, they're not really good with the language, the school can do it for them. It's the utmost importance that people in the Chinese community are aware of this because your kids are being victimized and we need it to stop, right? Because this kid, all he did for six days is just go from one internet cafe to another. He didn't, he didn't um, contact any friends because he was told not to. He didn't want anything to happen to his mom and dad, so he stayed awake for like a week. Yes? Question. I guess I have a concern because there's mother out there. How old are, these, how old are the, the children that are living with these kids? Where is the legal age that they're allowed to be living with? Yeah, the sister's 17, so okay. I mean, that is, is not 19? No. Okay. That, that is common, and many of them will have aunts or uncles in the general vicinity. Okay, because you know that wasn't the issue, a 15 year old was taking care of He was being taken care of by an, uh, an older sister. Okay. So these kids are all relatively young. They were teenagers, one was in their 20s, but these are the kids that were told, get out of the house because your parents are in danger. The, the other sibling or friend or relative that was living with them was the one getting the call saying they were kidnapped. Pretty scary for a 15 year old kid not from here. Like, think of your kids and your grandkids in, I don't know, Budapest. Don't speak the language, don't really know the culture, don't know too much about it, and then this happens and you get a call saying your kid's been kidnapped. Like, is there anything worse? I don't know. It's in the top 10 for sure, worse, right? So we want to ensure to everybody that nobody got hurt in this. Some people lost some money, not going to lie, they did. Not a ton of money, but a substantial amount. Um, to err on the side of caution, I don't think any of these were paid because Toronto knew about it. Again, started in the summer in BC. So if you go online and just Google virtual kidnapping, you'll get kind of the story. It's the basic. One part of the family gets told one thing, the other part gets told they've been kidnapped. It's the Chinese government and Chinese police. Okay? Hopefully, we can put an end to this quickly. We'll be on to something else. But this literally happened on the 23rd, right? I think of October? Yeah. yeah. So, and again, we were going to do a press release. It's just because other stuff was happening at the station. And I was going to put out a press release this week through our media relations. But when Toronto called on Friday, I called our media relations to say, oops, 
sorry, but now Toronto's going to do it. But it doesn't matter, Toronto, York, potatoes, potatoes, it's all the same thing, as long as the information gets out to the community to make everyone aware. The only way we could stop this particular scam is to educate people, right? So this is like